Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to this Sunday morning service at the Victoria Centre of Kensham Methodist Church. I have one notice that I've been asked to give. Oh, first of all, a very warm welcome to any visitors or anybody who may be watching this on the recording on, on the internet later on. I have a notice. So I just turn on top of it. Um, from Sandra Sprague concerning the fundraising quiz which will be held next Saturday, November the 2nd at 7pm in the Fear Hall. Please bring your own drinks. Cost is £5 and tables will be made, made up of four to six people. No tickets necessary. Pay on the evening. We hope to have lots of support from church members Many thanks from Sandra Sprague. I wish we have a moment of quiet to prepare for the service. And shall we now share in reading the prayer of preparation? Lord, as we come to worship, open our eyes to the glory of your creation. Open our minds to hear your word and open our hearts to respond to the needs of the world about us. Amen. Thank you. And now it's my privilege to welcome Cathy Diamond to lead our service this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. And may I add my welcome to, to Richard's. Come, come, come. Meet with your amazing God. Leave your preconceptions behind. Come, come, to seek and to find. Come, to meet the Lord of the universe. Come, 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 worship the one true God. Let's join in prayer. Lord God, you are awesome beyond measure. We are so small in comparison, yet you welcome us into your presence. Reveal yourself to us today. Help us to see who you are as we bow down before the God of the universe, the God of love beyond our understanding. Help us to worship you in a worthy way. Amen. We're joined to sing hymn number 87, Praise to the Living God, or Praised Be His Name, who was and is and is to be, for e'er the same. 87. <laughs>
we join again in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you today with open hearts and minds, ready to hear your voice and see your glory. Thank you for your presence among us, for your grace that sustains us. Guide us in our worship and speak to us through your word and spirit. Help us to listen to your voice and to respond with faith and obedience. Help us to see your face and to reflect your love and compassion. Help us to follow your will and serve your purposes. Holy God, you are the creator of all things and the source of all wisdom, the ruler of all nations and the judge of all people. You are the redeemer of all sinners and the healer of all wounds the giver of all gifts and the provider of all needs. We adore you, O God, and we bless your holy name. Yet, merciful God, we have heard your word and not obeyed it. We have seen your works and not appreciated them. We have received your grace but not shared it. We have known your love, but not shared that. We have been blind to your presence and deaf to your call. We have been selfish in our desires and careless in our actions. Forgive us, O God. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Restore us, O God and renew us in your image. So loving God, thank you that you do not treat us as our sins deserve, but as your children whom you love. We thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Thank you that you have opened our eyes to see your grace and our ears to hear your voice. Amen. We join for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I am his kingdom, and I will be the Lord, for I am the Lord. So our theme today is, I had heard, but now I see. So can we have this picture on the screen? Right, now, when I first looked at this picture in my roots material, I thought it was just the light in the complete darkness. But then... I looked again later and I realised there was a lighthouse there. So what else can you see besides the lighthouse? Because when I went on the website and looked again, behold, there are all sorts of other things there. So we've we've got um, houses. Yeah, we've got houses. And I think there's a bit of yellow down the bottom here, which I could see on my laptop. and that was gorse, I reckon. Um, and then I think there's the sea, because you usually have a lighthouse by the sea, don't you? <laughs> so, 
there was a lot more to it than when I first looked at it and only picked out that little light at the top. So it occurred to me that sometimes God comes to us in a flash and other times, little by little, we behold him and know him near. Now, do you have an image of God? Is there something, you know, if, if you're thinking of God, that you've got some sort of, of image of him? Is he a man on a throne, aloof and far above you? Or is he a friend sat beside you? Or is he a teacher that disciplines you? Or a talent show judge that says, you've done wonderfully. Is God like the lighthouse in the picture? A light shining in the darkness. And if you have a favourite picture of God, is what you have you find helpful about what is it about that image that you find helpful? My favourite image would be air. Like, almost like fog swirling around me. Because air is in you and around you. And I believe God is in you and around you. The light image is a powerful one because we are often in the dark about what God is, as he's mysterious. So it's good when light is shed on him to guide us in our everyday living. Are there ideas or images that you find unhelpful in your understanding of him? Perhaps the, the old man with a beard on a cloud it does portray him above our understanding and aloof. And then I wondered, is God man or woman? Is he genderless? I don't think he's an it. And then I looked up the Nicene Creed. And God is depicted there. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. So you've got quite a lot of images of God there. You know, the Father image looking after you, the Almighty above and hard to understand, the maker of heaven and earth, so the creator, and all that is seen and unseen, like air, air which is vital for life. This creed was formulated in A.D. 318, so it is a very old idea of God. I think probably, for me anyway, it's where I had my first understanding of God because it was part of our communion liturgy for a long time, though I, I haven't heard it used for a long time recently. Now let us consider whether we've had a, a vivid moment in our faith journey when God became clearer to us. I didn't have anything come in, but sort of the clouds gone and the darkness disappeared. A sort of a light bulb moment when you've been tussling with who and what God is and how you should be living your life and, and bringing fulfilment to our lives. I wondered whether there was anybody with a recent or even a longer term experience that they might like to share with us. Anybody going to put their hand up? No, never mind. You can go home and think about it. We're going to consider Job's conclusion where he is with God and the effect it had on its life, on his life and then on Jesus' encounter with Bartimaeus and the effect that Jesus had on his life. But for the moment, we are going to sing again, and it's 157, 
God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging word, each from age to age proclaiming, God the one, the righteous Lord. One, five, seven. This last month, the Roots Material and the Lectionary have been following Job and had some very sort of grim passages as Job is a bit grim, isn't he? But we have a happy passage today. It's the last chapter of Job we're reading from. So, all's well that ends well, or does it? Might the passage taken at face value reinforce the prosperity theory? And is it, and is it acquiescent to God to perceive an impot- omnipotence, I can't say it this morning, healthy or helpful? Job accepts God's power where he has, as he has done throughout. What matters to Job is the sense that he has met God. Right then, thank you, Janet. As you can see, the reading comes from the 42nd chapter of Job and is verses 1 to 6 and 10 to 17. Job answered the Lord, 
I know that you can do all things and that no purpose is beyond you. You ask, who is this obscuring counsel yet lacking knowledge? But I have spoken of things which I have not understood, things too wonderful for me to know. Listen and let me speak. You, you said, I shall put questions to you and you must answer. I knew of you then only by report, but now I see you with my own eyes. Therefore, I yield, repenting in dust and ashes. The Lord restored Job's fortunes and gave him twice the possessions he had before. All Job's brothers and sisters and his acquaintance of former days came and feasted with him in his home. They consoled and comforted him for all the misfortunes which the Lord had inflicted on him. And each of them gave him a sheep and a gold ring. Thus the Lord blessed the end of Job's life more than the beginning. He had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen and as many sheep and donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named his eldest daughter Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Keran Hapuk. There were no women in all the world so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance with their brothers. Therefore, after this, Job lived another 140 years. He saw his sons and his grandsons to four generations, and he died at a very good age. So that was 140 years after his first years, isn't it? I think verse 5 is the critical one. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Job coming to his understanding of God. We turn again to our hymn books. This time it's 111. Not one I'm very familiar with. By the way, Elspeth chose all the hymns today. So if you want to pat somebody on the back because you liked them, that's who you pat on the back. Um, I don't know what you'd do if you didn't like them. So, 111, Lord of the boundless curves of space and time's deep mystery, to your creative might we trace all nature's energy.
Our Gospel reading is from Mark. And here we have another story of restoration, the last of the healing miracles in Mark. Mark rarely records names in connections with healings, which suggests the story is based on eyewitness reports and that Bartimaeus was known in the later church. So we hear from Mark. Thank you. As you see, the reading is from Mark chapter 10. Then Jesus and the disciples came to Jericho, and as they were leaving, a a large crowd gathered. Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting in his usual place by the side of the road. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to call out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Many of the people sharply told him to keep quiet, but he shouted all the more. Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stood quite still and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying, it's all right now, get up, he's calling you. At this, he threw off his coat jumped to his feet, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, he asked him. Oh, master, let me see again. Go on your way then, returned Jesus. Your faith has healed you. And Bartimaeus recovered his sight at once and followed Jesus along the road. I had heard, but now I see. We've considered our image of God and what is helpful and what is unhelpful to us in our faith journey. Job's faith journey was long and hard. He lost his family, his health, his livelihood. He had long discussions with his three friends who maintained that he must have done something wrong for all this to have happened. The thinking of their day was that piety and prosperity prosperity went hand in hand. So if he lost his prosperity, he must have done something wrong. He must have sinned but he knew he'd not. Yet, it made him distant from God, even though he never lost his faith in God. Have you felt distant from God at times? Have you lost your faith? Or have you been like Job, that you've worked through your faith? and work through and in time to find God even closer. Well, that's been my experience. When I felt distance from God, I've just kept praying, kept reading the Bible, and kept coming to worship. And suddenly I found God's there, right beside me all the time. But what matters to Job is that he has, has the sense that he has met with God, despite all that happened to him. The restoration of all Job's uh, fortunes that we hear at the end of our reading was not a reward for good behaviour, it was God's gift and his restoration, even if it goes beyond what 
Job possessed at the beginning. And he possessed quite a lot at the beginning. So what is the purpose of this book? C.S. Rod argues that the, on his book on Job, if in the end we are re- willing to remain with mystery, as the writer of Job left us, placing fellowship with God above intellectual understanding of the problem of suffering and being satisfied with religious encounter and the value of soul making or character forming as the explanation remains the best result. From a moral aspect, it has to be asked whether the extent and the severity of the suffering can ever be regarded as the necessary cost for making souls, especially when many souls seem to be crushed rather than lifted to heroic virtue. Only a cross and a wounded God remain for us to cling to. The daily Bible readings that I do have been on the Song of Solomon recently. In chapter 3, it talks of a woman losing her soul and going out at night to look for it. In the comment by Catherine Williams, she says, Occasionally, God seems to withdraw from us and we have to search to be reunited. He is not always easy to catch. But our searching and our longing for him can lead us into a deeper, more mature relationship as our faith is tested and strengthened. On finding God, we hold on tightly, knowing that we have come home. It took Job a long time to see where God is in his life with all its difficulties. There will be times when we have to be patient in our search for God and in our faith journey. But he will eventually reveal himself as he did to Job. Apparently, although I have not read the book, in his book, A Grief Observed, C.S. Lewis spoke of the living picture of someone in your mind that may not actually reflect the true person. He explained that he did not want his idea of God, but he wanted God. He seems to be suggesting it is easy to create an image of who we think someone is and then are surprised when they behave in a different way than we expected. I think this is often true of people in the public eye, counsellors, politicians, teachers and the like. They have their private and their public persona. The same can be true of our image of God. It may not be quite true. So, what of Bartimaeus? He was like Job, suffering because of physical blindness. But was it spiritual blindness that was his problem? Yet he called out to Jesus when he came by in the crowd. Bartimaeus knew his need of God and was prepared to fight for Jesus to heal him in every sense. I found a bit in the Tom Wright's um, commentary, Mark for Everyone, quite helpful. But it's small print, so I got to not see you and see the print for a minute. So Tom Wright says, Mark is quite clear. Bartimaeus is the model to imitate. Unlike the disciples, who really had not understood what Jesus was about. Bartimaeus is already a man of faith, courage, and true discipleship. He recognizes who Jesus is, son of David. 
he clearly believes Jesus can help him. And Jesus does say, your faith has saved you. He leaves his begging. The cloak would have been spread on the ground to receive the money. Jericho is seldom cold enough for anyone to wear a cloak in the day. And Bartimaeus follows Jesus on the way. He makes a stark contrast with the disciples. Remember how when Jesus said to James and John, what do you want me to do for you? All he got was a request for power and prestige and glory. As with the blind man in chapter 8, the healing of Bartimaeus is a sign that Jesus is trying to open his followers' eyes to see him not just as Messiah, but as the one who would give his life to bring salvation to all. So <clears throat> that's Tom Wright's thoughts on, oh, well, some of his thoughts on Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was not put off by those who chided him for shouting. There are times when suffering leads, leads to shouting. And that instance on the news about the Aboriginal woman, Linda Thorpe, came into my mind. Um, she was escorted out of King Charles' presence for her protest, which could have been quite justified, but not timely. Have you ever had something you wanted to shout about, to protest about, about people's suffering? Probably. We all have, as there is a lot of injustice and suffering in the world. Bartimaeus had heard Jesus coming and grabbed the moment to get restoration of his sight. One would have thought it was obvious to Jesus what he needed. But he asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Is he challenging him to really think of the consequences of gaining his sight again? He would have to take up responsibilities that he would not have as a blind man. Bartimaeus was sure what he wanted. I want my sight back. So he had had sight. He knew what it was to see. And he'd lost sight. Physically and spiritually. What would we answer if Jesus were here and asked us, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Would it be peace of mind? A deeper understanding of God? Or to better comprehend what the world requires and what part we need to take? Do we, like Job and Bartimaeus, want to have full spiritual insight into God? We don't want to be cloudy, as sight can get when you've got eye conditions such as macular degeneration or cataracts. Do we need to be clear-sighted to see God aright, to have spiritual sight restored? We have to see what it is God is calling us to do. Do we have to spend more time in prayer and reflection? Do we need to see God as the one who stands with us in our suffering? Do we need to see God as our healer? Job's realisation that God is the omnipotent creator leads him to recognise that God spoke of things beyond Job's understanding. The only way forward, therefore, is to repent and to recognise God's unfathomable mystery. We, too, 
are invited to embrace the mystery and allow ourselves to be changed by our encounter with God to see him in new eyes, just as Bartimaeus was able to do. Both Job and Bartimaeus had faith in God and his power and his mystery. I had heard, but now I see. Amen. We turn again to our hymn books, which, um, as I prepared my service, seemed to fit in even more than when I, fir- when I first looked at the hymn. I thought, oh, I'm surprised at that one. But it just fits beautifully. Be still and know that I am God. 18. prayer and then prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Lord, we offer our lives. We offer our monetary goods, our time and our talents. We also bring you those that are in the prayer book that they may know your presence, your presence in their suffering and their difficulties, your presence when the clouds clear and they can see you clearly. So bless our humble offerings and use them to your honour and glory in this place now and ever. Amen. God of power, our great high priest, you are holy and blameless, exalted above the heavens. You have been made perfect forever. Thank you that you came to our world in a vulnerable human flesh to give sight to the blind hope to the weary, and comfort to those in pain. You show us the way to the Father, and model the way of compassion. All praise to you, our Lord and Saviour.
this Sunday is Bible Sunday and also the Torch Trust Sunday. So our intercessions are for them. Lord, we long to see you clearly and know you near. We pray for those who are blind to your love and your forgiveness and to life abundant. We thank you for our Bibles to learn of you. We thank you for those who have translated them into so many languages. We ask that you bless the work of the Bible Society with opportunities to promote your word and the finance to do it. Bless the Society's work worldwide with its many translations. Bless the distributions to many isolated places so as many are able to read your word and come to know you themselves. Yet we're also mindful of those that have sight loss, thus are unable to read your word and depend on audio versions. We pray for the Torch Trust that supports many with sight loss, providing fellowship, worship, and hearing books. Lord, in Jesus' name, bless these people. Amen. And then a prayer called Seeing with God's Eyes. It's a, and there is a response. When I say living God, you can respond with, teach us to see with your eyes. Living God, teach us to see with your eyes. All knowing, all powerful, all seeing, ever active and ever present in our world, help us to capture something of your wonder, to glimpse something of your greatness, to see that our Small horizons are not the last word. Living God, teach us to see with your eyes. Enable us to see life from your perspective with its opportunities, potential, goodness and beauty. Living God, teach us to see with your eyes. Show us that where we see no future, your promise continues. Where we see only obstacles, you have planned the way through. Where we see only our limitations, you see opportunities. Where we see despair, you see hope. Where we see divisions, your work towards re reconciliation. You work towards reconciliation. And where we see sorrow, you are longing to bring joy. Living God, teach us to see with your eyes. Give us courage to dream dreams, to have a vision of the future for ourselves, for our church, and for the world. Living God, teach us to see with your eyes. Give us faith to see life in a new light, a different way, from a wider perspective, and give us the determination not just to dream, but to work towards the fulfillment of our vision, working for your kingdom here on earth. 
living God, teach us to see with your eyes. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. We draw our worship to a close with three, four, five. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me to whom? To him? Uh, sorry. For him to whom death pursued. Three, four, five. Thank you.
you to all those that helped for this service on the sound, the laptop, the organ, and elsewhere. Go with God and search for his wonders. Go with God and look for his glory. Go with God to proclaim his greatness. Go with God as your Lord and your friend. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.